This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Jeanette Henry Costo, editor of the Indian Historian, speaks on the current Indian revival movement in historical perspective. This is the first of nine programs recorded at Iowa State University's National Affairs Institute devoted to the American Indian. Mrs. Costo. There are some things to discuss and understand before we come to the actual title of the subject with which we will be dealing today. Let me make this one remark before proceeding to the subject itself. One would have to be totally blind not to see that a profound and cataclysmic change is taking place in this country today. The civil rights movement of the Negro is only one part of it. All institutions are being challenged and the very fabric of American government is being attacked. The place of the Indian in this situation is unique. We have only a million and a half to two million people in this country, yet we believe that the Indian situation lies at the very heart of the troubles with which this nation is beset. And the Indian revival movement today is a profound expression of this condition. You know, the United States is a nation built upon conflict, a conflict which began with the first European immigrants to these shores in 1492. Please note, I don't say discoverers. We discovered this continent many thousands of years before Columbus was even born. It is a conflict which is unresolved to this day. As scholars, we are interested and should seek to understand causes. As responsible and responsive members of the human race, we have an obligation to seek solutions. I will not insult your intelligence by giving you a long recitation of misconceptions about my people, but these few things do need to be said. It is written in the textbooks that the people of this country were savages, but we had a technology of our own, a complex society, well-developed and complex languages. It is said that we were an uncivilized race of people. Before the white contact, we had peace, and we knew the growth of a unique and peaceful society. It is said that we were heathens, yet we worshiped one God. We treasured the earth. We lived in harmony with nature. We respected individual rights. We had government by consent of the government, and the people ruled. We made cloth from cotton. We grew a variety of vegetables. We knew and used irrigation and conservation. Our arts are even now being copied in poor imitations of the real thing. We were rich in an oral literature and a thousands of years history which we treasured and passed on as a beloved heritage. We had no orphans, no poverty, no smog, no nuclear wars, and no ecological pro problems. We gave to the world medicinal plants, the canoe, the toboggan, the art of treating fractures, the hammock, the knowledge of fishing and hunting techniques, the art of tree girdling, without which the West could not have been settled. Our trails have become highways. Our irrigation systems have caused scientists to marvel. You can read all about it in textbooks on the American Indian, which is on display in the bookstore. Today, however, 
We are the least educated as a people, the poorest economically, the most neglected, and the least understood. How did this happen? Upon white contact, two economic systems came in conflict. One was a society built on a mixture of agricultural pursuits, the uses of human resources, and the uses of human beings. I don't say exploitation, I say uses. The cultural groups that existed here could be distinguished by one generalization. They were varied. They were highly different one from another. What happened was that there was a hunger for land on the part of those who came. And yet, remembering our past, we remember that the first recognition that there was a people, a civilized people with a complex society on these shores, was the fact that the Europeans made treaty with us and considered us as sovereign nations. You can't make treaties with anybody unless that other party is a sovereign nation, and they did make treaties with us. And the first treaty was made in 1613 with the Dutch in trade. Treaty making ended in 1871. By 1792, the Indians were encircled by whites. By the end of the 18th century, the economy of both Indians and Europeans on American land had changed. The Indians now needed markets for their furs, agricultural products, their cloth, and their game. The variety of tribal cultures, the variety of languages, the different geographical locations made it difficult for the tribes to unite as they should and must have united in order to survive. But on the other hand, the Europeans by the end of the 18th century had emerged as a single nation, as a single political power from among the heterogeneous and polyglot immigrants and invaders who came here. From this time on, and from the beginning of white contact, except for a short period, a short honeymoon period that lasted but a very few years, there were 400 years of conflict. From the revolt of the Powhatan people in Virginia in 1622, to the revolt of the Pueblos under Pope in 1680, to the Black Hawk War in 1830, and the Apaches of the Southwest in 1869. There was conflict, armed conflict, guerrilla warfare, and wars even between the Indians themselves, goaded by the various powers of the European countries. I would like to deal very briefly with this idea about the Apaches that persists in all the textbooks, even in the best textbooks and in the best books for general public reading, the Apaches of the Southwest are referred to as animals, vicious, warlike. It is not remembered, nor is it understood, that the Apaches of the Southwest were waging a guerrilla war against invaders. And in a guerrilla war, anything goes. The Apaches when we write the history of this nation, will be brought forward as the heroes of the land and of their people, and not as nasty, filthy, ugly savages, such as the history books now portray them. And in connection with this 400 years in co of conflict, it was the Creek Chief Pleasant Porter who said, we have led the vanguard of civilization in our conflicts with you for tribal existence from ocean to ocean. Black Hawk, when he surrendered after his war with the Europeans, said the following, we told the whites to let us alone but they followed on and coiled themselves among us like snakes. 
They poisoned us by their touch. We were becoming like them, hypocrites and liars, all talkers and no workers. The main issue was possession of the land. That was the main issue then. It is the main issue today. Let me just say this one thing. Indians were never ashamed to speak in the most emotional and sentimental terms about their land. Listen to Black Hawk again. I love to look upon the Mississippi, he said. I have looked upon it from a child. I love that beautiful river. My home has always been upon its banks. I will say no more. And Ten Bears, the Comanche, in October 1867, at Medicine Lodge Creek in southern Kansas said, I was born on the prairie where the wind blew free and there was nothing to break the light of the sun. I want no blood upon my land to stain the grass. I want it clear and pure, and I want it so that all who go through among my people may find peace when they come in and leave it when they go out. But in 1882, George Ellis, a well-known Massachusetts clergyman and author, said this, we have a full right by our own best wisdom and then even by compulsion to dictate terms and conditions to the Indians, to use constraint and force to say what we intend to do and what they must and shall do. This rightful power of ours will relieve us from conforming to or even consulting to any troublesome extent the views and inclinations of Indians whom we are to manage. The Indian must be made to feel he is in the grasp of a superior. And another, a United States senator said, all these efforts concerning the Indians are valueless unless they are based upon force, supplemented by force, and continued by force. And so the lines were drawn. The native was dispossessed in his own land. He was kicked from one end of the country to another and finally lost to an alien people. And the first step in order to get rid of the so-called Indian problem was removal. That's when you take a people from their homes and push them on somewhere else, and then you take them from there and push them on somewhere else. The Cherokees were removed to Arkansas. Then they were removed to o Oklahoma, then back to Arkansas, then back to Oklahoma. The Oneidas to Wisconsin. The Iroquois were removed to Arkansas, then to Wisconsin, then to Kansas. The Missouris were removed in 1821 to Kansas. The Osages were removed on, on the southern border of Kansas. Iowa became a state in 1846. All Indians were moved west of the Missouri River, except for one Sauk and Fox group that bought a small, one fox group that bought a small tract of land with their own money. Now, I almost made a mistake there because all the history books, including a report by a noted anthropologist, Dr. Saul Tex, calls it Sauk and Fox. Only the Meskwaki, known also as the people of the Red Earth or Red Earth people, bought this land with their own funds. Some Seminoles were removed to Oklahoma. Among the five civilized tribes, which were Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, were finally removed, but the Seminoles remained, and others, some of them, drifted home again. In Texas, some Arkansas Cherokees settled down and prospered. Also, Delawares, Shawnees, Kickapoos, and others from southern states. In 1835, during the, the, the war with Mexico, the Indians helped Texas. Then they were driven out of Texas into Indian Territory in 1839. Some fled that area, and about 100 Kickapoos ran away to Mexico. A small reservation was set apart for the Caddo's and Tonkawas and a band of Comanches. The Indian-hating Texans attacked them, and they were removed. In 1850s, the Indians settled in Kansas were homeless and driven. The Wyandettes was dispossessed in Kansas, then sent to Oklahoma. In 1855, the Akamaws lost their vast land of 10 million acres, leaving them with a small reservation. 
In 1862, the Sioux rose up in Minnesota against this sort of treatment. In 1861, the Cheyennes and Arapahoes removed from their lands large areas of Colorado. The squatters did that for them, and they were put on a small reservation in southeastern Colorado, but they didn't settle there. They signed a treaty, but there was no interpreter present to tell them what was in it. In 1863, the Navajos were subjected to the long walk to Bosque Redondo, where they remained in captivity until 1868 when they signed a treaty, and then it took some years before they were returned home. The railroads came in the 1870s and dispossessed the Indians of some more of their land. Land grabbers came in 1882 and took away some more of the land. Even international boundaries were not safe. In 1873, a military force under Colonel <coughs> Mackenzie invaded Mexico to bring back the Kickapoos. As if this were not enough, because it failed. Wherever the Indians were kicked, they got up and started again. Their languages still existed. The tribes that were disrupted came together again. Small groups and various tribes united and formed another tribe. There was an attempt at conquest by legislation. In 1832, the Removal Act was passed. In 1889, the Homestead Act created a boom in Indian territory so that they stood there on the edge of Indian territory, ready to go. And the flag was down, and everybody said, go, and they rushed upon the land and grasped it from the Indians. It was that crude, that brutal, that outrageous. In 1887, the Dawes Act was enacted and signed, which involved the allotment of land to Indians. That was to make them more independent, you see. And here you had a very strange uh, combination of forces. The humanitarians called it the Magna Carta for the American Indian, and others said that the Indians would be more independent. Well, they were made so independent that they were divested of 12,071,300 acres of land stolen from the people. Each time a survey, a survey was done in connection with allotment, it was followed by a land rush through the 1890s. A struggle began against allotment and the Dawes Act. People had to hide and were arrested. There were enforcers sent out because the Indians refused to submit to it. They knew they would lose their land, lose their country. In 1898, the Curtis Act was, was passed. The Choctaws uh, were forced to allot their land, and their property was divided. The termination was affected of their government. They had been removed, you see, and upon removal, they came to Oklahoma and set up and developed a new government, a successful government. Schools, granaries, industries, newspapers were developed. The principal chiefs of the five civilized tribes are now named by the Secretary of the Interior. We're fighting to have this ended, but they have been named by the Secretary of the Interior to this day. I don't think that it is necessary to describe any further the things that have been done to my people, the injustices the taking of the land, the attempt to exterminate, an effort at genocide, and the development of the art of warfare. Because anthropological and archaeological evidence now points to the fact that the art of warfare before white contact was very minimal and almost unknown. Indians began to fight Indians, and that thus this 400 years war became even more outrageous, people killing each other. And as a result of all these events, revival movements began to occur historically throughout the history of this country and throughout the history of the Native Americans. Pontiac, probably a Chippeway, but working from the Ottawa people, worked with a Delaware prophet whose name is not mentioned in history, who foretold the white defeat in 1762. 
On August 1st, 1763, the battle at Detroit Perrins Creek occurred in which the Pontiac army was defeated. The causes for this war and the causes for the development of this revival movement was the fact that squatters came upon Indian land and refused to move. These squatters were well-known criminals. They were army deserters, debtors, swindlers, and the United States government did not protect the Indians against this. The nature of this particular revival movement was, can be described in these words. Their philosophy was called the path. Everything white must go. The guns, the technology, the people, the good things as well as the bad things, all that is white must go. And of course it was unsuccessful. In this particular movement, the Wyandotte, Ottawas, Kickapoos, Shawnees, and Delawares were intimately involved, and it failed. Kennecook, a Kickapoo, in 1827, developed a movement which emphasized prayer and Indian identity. It didn't last long. Tecumseh, through his brother, known as the Prophet, in 1808, developed quite a movement, and the tenets of these movements were these. No one tribe could sell the land. The land was a common heritage of all tribes, that the Indians must throw away white ways, particularly drink, the use of animals, trade goods, and guns. All tribes are one. That was their tenet. It was the first truly pan-Indian movement in this country. And it failed when Tecumseh was killed in 1813. In the 1880s, a nativist movement originated called the Peyote Movement, which resulted in the formation of what is now known as the Native American Church and persists and is growing to this day. This involves the use of the peyote flower, which is not a hallucinatory drug, but which induces a feeling of euphoria and certain imagery in the mind. It is full of ritualistic practices. The people of the peyote movement are generally almost entirely peace-loving. They are not allowed to drink and mainly not allowed to smoke. They don't go out begging for money. They don't ask anybody for money. They prefer to remain quiet and practice the way of living which they feel will be most successful for them. The ghost dance originated in the last part of the 19th century through a prophet known as Wovoka, a Paiute, who had a vision. And he told the people, you must not fight. There will be a resurrection. And developed a whole ritualistic uh, pr uh, program of dances and chants. He even set a date for this resurrection when the people who were killed and died and the leaders would come up from the ground and again take over the leadership of the Indian people. He set the date as spring, 1891. But the people who fought under the banner of the ghost dance and Wovoka were defeated. And spring, 1891, came and there was no resurrection. The movement died. Among the Iroquois, a revivalist movement began called the Handsome Lake Religion. It was developed also as a result of a vision by an Indian whose name translates into English as Handsome Lake. They had a code, and the code concerned itself with moral regeneration among the, the uh, Iroquois. It concerned itself with education, social responsibility. They had a political code of neutrality and an absolutely necessity for unanimity in all matters. This Handsome Lake Code exists to this day, although in a lesser degree, but still exists. And they developed a public recitation of the code <clears throat> to the extent that in 1845, 
a sacred religious text was made available and recited, just like the Christian Bible or the Book of Mormon. A different movement began by the Cherokees in 1802. This was a secular, regenerative movement of the Cherokees, and listen to this. All those who still have an idea that these people might have been savages, uncivilized, and unlearned. In 1802, they set up a political structure. They held a constitutional convention. They developed concerted action by the elders and younger men, assisted by delegations of women. They set up schools and developed innovations in community and political organization. <clears throat> in 1808, legislation was passed by the Cherokee Nation for a body of codified laws. They established regulating companies called the Light Horse Guards, law and order people. In 1810, they legislated against the ancient tradition of clan revenge. In 1817, they established a bicameral legislature with a national committee and a national council. In 1820, they developed the administration of justice, and the territory was divided into eight districts, each with a council house court and judge, and also circuit court judges, and they developed a system of elections by the people. In 1822, they developed a national Supreme Court and defined the offices of their national political structure in this way. Unashamedly, they had two beloved men at the top. One was the president of the National Committee, the other was the speaker of the council. How often can you tell me of one speaker one president of the United States of America who can be called our beloved man. In 1825, the capital was established at New Echita. They established national printing press, published the Cherokee Phoenix. In 1827, they had a national constitutional convention and approved their constitution in 1828. They had freedom of religion because the Moravians, Baptists, Dutch, Dutch Reformed Church, Congregationalists, and Presbyterians were permitted to hold services and establish churches. They had only one condition. They must have schools. In 1829, however, the devout, religious, patriotic Georgians and Alabamans developed a song, and this song went like this. All I want in this creation is a pretty little girl and a big plantation way up yonder in the Cherokee Nation. That was the tip-off. Because long before then, the battle had begun for the taking of Cherokee lands. And when gold was found in the Cherokee hills, that was it. The Cherokees then began a legal battle. 
And in March 5, 1831, they came before the Supreme Court as a foreign state with the rights of an independent state, and the courts decided against them. In Worcester versus Georgia in 1832, they had a distinct victory because Chief Justice Marshall declared them a community, a nation within a nation. This didn't make any difference because President Jackson, who was called Chicken Snake by the Cherokee leader John Ridge, immediately violated the decision of the Supreme Court and had the Cherokee removed anyhow. It gets to be quite exciting. <clears throat> now in the 1900s, there began a reform movement which was, thank you, which was particularly distinguished by the organization of the Society of American Indians. And at that time, some very surprising things began to be noted, and that is that at the first convention of the Society of American Indians held in 1811, it was found that there were numerous uh, people who were Indian, knew themselves to be Indian, maintained their position as Indian, who were great scholars in many fields of work in this country. And they developed a society which published a magazine. The main effort was to develop, to develop a leadership, a well-organized, highly skilled leadership among the American Indians. The second purpose was to fight for citizenship. And in 1924, after the Negroes had attained citizenship, after the women had attained citizenship, this country finally broke down and gave my people citizenship. There was a disagreement in that movement between those who were militants, such as Dr. Carlos Montezuma and Apache, and those who believed in total assimilation, such as Arthur Parker an anthropologist without the degree of an anthropologist. And these struggles took place over a period of years until the society finally fell apart. Now I'm going to deal briefly with what is happening today. And before I do this, I would like to deal with the local situation here. If Iowa doesn't mind being called a local situation. If I were in Iowa, I would object. Nevertheless, right here in this state, you have a unique situation. You have a definable, independent, richly historic Indian group, the Meskwaki. And just for your pleasure, let us run over their history just a little bit. It might not be amiss. The Meskwaki and the Salk originally lived in what is now southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. Iowa was their traditional hunting grounds, almost the whole state. In 1726, the French attempted genocide against the Meskwaki, but in 1737, a conference of many other tribes prevailed upon them to stop. In 1831, they were moved to Iowa from Illinois after the Black Hawk War. In 1836 and 38, both the Salk and the Fox were moved to Kansas. Since 1856, the acreage which was purchased by them with their own money of land in Tama, and which is now called Meskwaki Settlement at Tama, has increased. Originally, it is estimated they bought approximately 600. Originally, <clears throat> they sold their ponies and purchased 80 acres of land, according to the record in Iowa. The state permitted this, but then for 11 years, federal annuities were stopped. In 1896, the Tama County white citizenship made a complaint against them and lobbied against them in Congress with some degree of success. But in 1804, before this, a small group of the Sauk, the Missouri River Sauk, 
the headman of this small group signed a treaty, which was obtained by tri trickery, relinquishing all their lands in Wisconsin, Illinois, and Missouri. And this was the basis for a la later claim. The foxes drew away and in one generation had moved over to their Iowa hunting grounds. And this issue was one of those which led to the Black Hawk War in 1832. Now, it is not generally known that historically and traditionally, the Meskwaki were agriculturists. They harvested wild rice. They raised corn, beans, squash, tobacco. They used both the dugout and the birch bark canoes. In 1650, this, the fox population was very um, conservatively estimated at 3,000. In 1728, it was estimated at 2,000. In 1805, it, it was estimated at 1,200. And in 1665, the Meskwaki were known to have at least 60 lodges, only 30 le leagues from Green Bay, Wisconsin. They were a powerful, peaceful, and industrious people. From the Sac and Fox Agency at Tama, o o Iowa, in September 1st, 1832, came this report. The Meskwaki Indians have purchased from time to time about 700 acres of land situated in the valley of the Iowa River in Tama County, and most of this tract is subject to overflow. They number about 350 persons, from 3,000 to 350. They have about 700 head of horses. They have in cultivation this year 175 acres, divided into about 50 lots. The production of corn is very successful and will amount to about 5,000 bushels and so on. And the reports that went on and on show a steady increase in these people who literally lift themselves up by their bootstraps. I'm going to go now into the situation today, and we will deal further with the Meskwaki who are now among you and whom it behooves you to help in every way possible with high priority. We have stated as the title of this report the situation today, the present, the current Indian revival movement. So therefore, we take it for granted that there is such a thing. And indeed, there is, if you can call it a revival movement, because revivalistic movements are usually known as religious movements, and this is not a religious movement, by and large. Some of it is, but very little. It can be characterized by these particular, by these particular points. First of all, it involves a great movement of youth. Second, there is militancy in the modern sense existing in this movement. Third, special youth organizations have been built up, something new in the Indian movement. Fourth, active traditionalists, such as the Iroquois, Onondaga, have come into the picture working together with the youth and by and large with many other groups. Fifth, and very important, is that this movement today has intercontinental elements. There is a beginning of unification of native peoples from South America, North America, and many other countries wherever there are native people. The next point is that for the first time, financial aid is being made available to Indian people to do what they think should be done. Seventh, there are Indian young people in higher education, and they are active. Eighth, there is a very definite struggle to preserve the existence of the Indian as a race, and it expresses itself in the following ways. There is a program and a real struggle going on now among the Iroquois Indians for the return of the wampum belts which were sacred relics and indications of their history, now held by the Museum of the State of New York. The Onondagas require these belts to be returned, 
the state of New York doesn't want to return them. The Indian people are now developing a massive campaign to make them return these belts. The languages are coming back on the same footing as the English language, and the Seneca people in New York State have waged a fierce struggle in the western part of the state to have the Seneca language taught to the extent that they even boycotted the school and to the extent that finally the school district decided to give them an opportunity. So they opened up a class in instruction in the Seneca language instead of Greek, and there were no Greeks there, but it's supposed to be a humanistic language, and expected a very small group to respond, and they had 60 people responding, 30 of whom were Indians and 30 of whom were white. It's quite possible that the Seneca language may begin to be spoken in the state of New York, and why not? There is a struggle against the exploitation of the Indian and his racial culture, such as is expressed in the fight at the Gallup ceremonial, in which a group of young Indians protested the ceremonial as being exploitative of the Indian and unfair to Indian culture and uh, developing degrading aspects of an understanding of Indian culture. The urban situation in the cities where the Indians live, a good many of them, has its own peculiarities. And there you have to consider the, the, the choice that an Indian must make as to whether he wishes to be uh, working as a tribalist or as an urban city Indian. What will happen, I am willing to predict, is that they will work on both fronts with the help of their tribes in the urban situation as well. The forms of the movement that have been taking place and are still taking place are these. Among the tribes, there is a struggle now going on against the old-time tribal bureaucracy, which was set up by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and is being maintained by the Bureau of Indian Affairs which is unresponsive to the Indian people, which maintains the Indian people in poverty, in which the Indian people do not have a voice, we are predicting that these will either begin to work for their people or will be replaced by younger and more skillful and more dedicated Native Americans. Indian clubs are being developed in colleges and universities. The National Congress for American Indians continues to exist, even though it was first established in 1944 by a group of Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, uh, people. Still continues to exist and be active. The American Indian Historical Society, an organization of honorary members, honored members, has held the first convocation of American Indian scholars ever held in this country, and will hold another one in August of this year. There are Bureau of Indian Affairs dominated groups in Washington, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs itself has not changed anything but the way in which they speak and the words which they use. The situation remains the same. Based on these general determinations, a program may be seen to materialize. And I'm speaking in, uh, strictly as an individual, and perhaps in a prophetic way. And this is extremely important. I don't think we have ever enunciated such goals, nor have we ever put together such a possible program. One, guaranteed protection for all reservations and an end to any termination of reservation land. Two, we want ownership of the entire public domain given to the tribes and the area of which this land is. Three, we want self-determination to decide what kind of a society we will have, what kind of a tribe it shall be, what kind of a government we shall have within our tribe. We want control over education and a guarantee that it shall be a real control, not a bureaucratic control. We want technological aid through advisors who shall work under our direction. 
We want priorities for Indians in all fields, including the granting of scholarship funds and finances for the development of the economic conditions of the tribes. We want recognition of our language by region on a par with English. We want indemnification for the murders and the lands taken from us during this 400 years war. It was given to the Germans and the Japanese. Why are the natives any different? We want a guarantee for economic development according to our own desires. We want religious freedom so that no textbook and no professor and no individual shall point at any Indian belief or cultural background and say this is savage, this is not Christian, this is not for us. If it's for us, we desire the right to practice it. We want a massive correction of the books now in use in the schools. But our responsibilities, my friend, as Indians, do not end with this. Only two points I would like to make with you. I think that there should be a worldwide declaration of ecological disaster, and that immediate emergency measures should be taken. This sounds like a very flamboyant thing to say on this small podium in this small section of the world and by this small person. But unless it is done, we are on a disaster route. And second, an end to all armed conflict. Now this is a big order and I have covered a lot of territory with you. What we want here is understanding, the beginning of a learning process, and particularly what we want wherever we go is to leave behind us a close contact and a real and profound understanding of the regional tribal group where we go. In this case, it is to the Meskwaki settlement at Tama that we direct your attention to the Meskwaki Indian language where it is not impossible to establish a chair of Meskwaki language learning at Iowa State University. And finally, I must tell you this, and we have kept this in strict confidence until now. I'm prepared to make it public now. The American Indian Historical Society is a small and very select organization of people who work at publishing books, doing research, going where it is necessary to help the tribes and the people. We have in our own field already acquired what everybody else is talking about, red power. We have red power, if you want to call it that, in connection with textbook correction. We are recognized as the experts, and we have been quite capable and able to effect corrections in textbooks, and this is a continuing program and a continuing task for us. We have some very good friends who recognize our expertise, our scholarship, and our responsibility and to whom we can go. Now I tell you, we want three universities in this country, preferably in the middle section of the country, for whom we will fight in order to constitute ecological centers for this country. Three places where Indians are respected where there is an Indian group of students operating and where we can expect expertise, scholarship, and work. I invite Iowa State University to consider the possibility of becoming one of these centers at our recommendation. The Indian is now coming to the fore in the environmental picture as an expert in ecological care, conservation. And we will support any university 
which we feel can do the job and is willing to do the job, and we will pull out all the stops to help. And if you think that something will not happen, try us. Thank you. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Jeanette Henry Costo, editor of the Indian Historian, spoke on the current Indian revival movement in historical perspective. This was the first in a series of nine programs recorded at Iowa State University's National Affairs Institute devoted to the American Indian. is a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.